Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar on Navigating New Election Laws 2020 Singapore. This is our program for tonight. And to start, I'd like to invite the president of our Singapore chapter, Jay, to give a few words. Thanks, Ben. Good evening, everybody. It's 2020 and elections have officially been announced in Singapore. So polling day is on the 10th of July, um, less than two weeks from, from today. This election is the 18th general election in Singapore and the 13th since independence um, to elect members of parliament to the 14th parliament of, uh, of Singapore. Now, before we go into the topic proper, as the president of the Singapore chapter of the Internet Society, I'd like to take the opportunity to say a few words about uh, ISOC. Um, since it was founded in 1992 by a number of people involved with the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, the Internet Society really is a global organization that's dedicated to ensuring the Internet stays open, transparent, and defined by you, really all of us, um, the users. ISOC challenges big issues related to the Internet. Uh, we encourage innovation through grants and fellowships that we offer globally, and um, working through chapters all over the world. Today's event is hosted by the uh, Internet Society Singapore chapter. And if you're interested in our events, please take a look at isocsg.org. The URL is, is on your screen. Now back to the elections. During the previous election, uh, we ran a similar event that was very well received. And given that we're living in a COVID-19 world today, uh, precautionary measures abound. Importantly, as part of the rules this year, there are no physical rallies or meetings that are, are permitted. So the role of online mechanisms and really the internet is particularly key. So today's webinar is quite timely um, in this age um, of pervasive social media usage and where internet users could potentially fall foul um, of the rules. We have a distinguished lineup today and we're very thankful to Kevin Tan, to Ang Peng Hua and Remy Chu. ISOC Singapore's uh, Ankur Gupta will help to summarize um, the key points at the end of the session and Brian Tan will moderate today's session. So I'll hand this now over to, to Brian, and again to everybody on behalf of the Internet Society Singapore chapter, welcome and thank you. Brian, over to you. Thanks, Jay. Um, first off, uh, let me run through uh, the logistics uh, for today. Uh, so can we get that screen up? Yes. Uh, so, there are a couple of points to run through just to get through tonight's um, meeting. Uh, we do want to finish by 8 p.m. because I think there's something uh, exciting happening on television. So, uh, we're going to try to make it then. So, in order to do so, uh, these are a couple of things that we are going to suggest. Uh, we're going to mute everyone except for the speakers uh, when they're speaking. Uh, hold your questions uh, till the Q&A &A time will be at the end. Uh, this presentation will be recorded. If you have a question, uh, please use the private chat facility. You see that at the bottom of your Zoom chat message uh, and send that uh, directly to me. So by default, all questions are anonymous. Uh, we, unless you really insist that you want to be named, then put that in your question. Uh, we will have to kind of moderate your question so that we can get them all out to the speakers uh, as efficiently as possible. Okay, and uh, well, there's some disclaimers there that you can uh, quickly take a look, but I'm just going to move uh, quickly to start off uh, today's uh, webinar with a quick... Um, can we go to the poll? Is the poll ready? Ah, okay. So you see a poll in front of you. It's a single question. Um, we are asking you which type of participant are you. I'm going to give you 20 seconds to think about uh, what you want to put in there, and uh, we will have a quick uh, view of the results. Uh, so go in and uh, fit yourself into one of these categories.
okay, I think everyone should be done. What, what are the results like? Can we pull them up? Okay, great. So we've got some people from media, number of academics, uh, some ordinary citizens uh, and PRs. Well, a lot actually, so 65%, two thirds. Okay, so we have a quick idea of the people on this uh, webinar and uh, it's a good time to begin uh, the program for today. Uh, I just want to quickly take you through uh, the program. Uh, we have uh, Kevin Tan, Professor Kevin Tan, who is going to start off with uh, what candidates and parties need to do to keep in line with the new election laws that, uh, election media laws that are, are coming in place. Uh, we have Professor Ang Peng Hua, who will be uh, talking about the new battleground for 2020 this year uh, on, on the media. Uh, we have uh, Remy Chu then uh, talking about what, you know, how about the people, the folk from media and uh, what I call other non-combatant, ordinary folk like you and I, um, how do we make sure that we don't fall foul of this? Uh, then as promised, we'll do a Q&A, maybe a closing poll just before that. Uh, and we're going to get Anka to, um, to summarize everything. But I'd like to do a formal introduction of uh, our various speakers. So, uh, you will see uh, Professor Kevin Tan, who's there. Kevin, can you wave? Yeah, okay, that's him. Um, professor Kevin Tan is a professor with the NUS Law School, uh, very well known. Uh, he taught a lot of laws. He was my professor also, cons constitutional law. Uh, so he's written a couple of textbooks. Uh, you see, you'll see him all over the news, uh, I think this, this season again, because this is his area. Uh, next up, we have uh, Professor Ang Penghua. Uh, who's a professor at the NTU Wee Kim Lee School of uh, Communications and Information. Uh, Peng Hua is also active with uh, the Consumer Association. Uh, he is a past president of the Internet Society. I think he's the founding, he was the founding president, actually, of the Singapore chapter. Uh, and then we have Remy Chu. Uh, Remy is a director with uh, Peter Lo and Chu. Uh, and he looks like a young man because he is a young man. Uh, in 2016, he was awarded... Uh, outstanding Young Lawyer for the Year by uh, the International Bar Association. So congratulations, uh, Remy. And uh, finally, we have uh, Anka Gupta. Uh, Anka is with uh, Tabasic Poly. Uh, he lectures there. Uh, he's also a vice president. He's a current vice president of the Internet Society. And uh, he says he likes to dabble and stuff in his free time. Okay, so uh, without... Uh, you know, me rambling on, I'm going to pass this over to Kevin, uh, who will uh, kick off tonight with, uh, and, and he'll talk about uh, what candidates and parties need to do to keep in line with the new election media laws. Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, and uh, welcome all of you to, to this session. I know this session was meant to talk about the new internet laws, but I think uh, it's not possible to talk about the new without looking at the old. So what I propose to do in the sort of 10 minutes allocated to me is to try and share with you what the prevailing laws are at various stages of an election, from a nomination to the election itself. So if you just give me a second, I'd like to share my screen with you so that uh, we can so that we can look at uh, some of these things. Uh, more closely. Okay. Uh, are we able to see the screen properly? Yes, it's yep. okay. We it's okay, yeah? It. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, so, the topic here is on keeping in line. How do we make sure that we, we don't run afoul of the law, whether you are a uh, elector or whether you're a candidate? Well, uh, we start off with the campaign period, right? When is the campaign period? I know this is now kind of over already in terms of nomination day because that was yesterday. Um, but what is the campaign period uh, that we're looking at? And officially, it starts uh, at the close of nomination day uh, up to the eve of polling day. So that would have been 12.30 yesterday, 30th of, I beg your pardon, 30th of June rather than July. Uh, right up to 11.59 p.m. on the 8th of July uh, because there is a day called cooling off day. The day before the actual polls itself is designated as a cooling off day where you are not allowed to do any campaigning of any sort uh, from midnight of that day uh, right up to uh, the polls itself, which is 8 p.m., 8 a.m. Uh, on the 10th of July. So actually it's a little bit more than 
one cooling of days, one day plus, sort of like eight, eight hours. hours after that. Okay, so this is the campaign period uh, that uh, we should concern ourselves with. Nomination is already over. What we saw yesterday, and this was where some of the new rules came in previously, uh, you could go into the nomination center if you were a candidate together with all your supporters, but because of the uh, COVID-19 situation, restrictions have been placed. And if you look at the number of rules that have actually been promulgated, the subsidiary legislation and regulations that are promulgated, uh, they, they would fit, fit up several, they will fill several pages in terms of listing, right? So what are we looking at here? Uh, the candidate can go in. Of course, the assenters and the seconders have to be with the candidate to show that they were in fact the ones who assented and seconded the candidate. Uh, and uh, if you are a candidate and you uh, are unable to attend the nomination itself, uh, you can, by way uh, of a power of attorney, appoint a representative uh, if you are under a quarantine or stay home order. So this is basically what happened to Kenneth Jayaratnam of the Reform Party because uh, he had just returned from the UK and is under a stay home order. So he, in fact, uh, got somebody else to go and do the nominations for him, right? What's next? Now, uh, how much are you allowed to spend in terms uh, of uh, campaigns? Now, Singapore uh, adopts a limited campaign spending uh, model of elections uh, in a bit to ensure that, you know, elections does not become uh, a, a, a sort of a, a issue with how much money you actually have in your coffers. Right, uh, And so uh, you first have to ensure that you put in a deposit that is to show seriousness of mind and purpose. Uh, and this year, the, in this election, it's $13,500 per candidate. Uh, now, they've, th what is new is that they've uh, developed a new rule of computing this amount. In fact, if they use the old formula, that would have been uh, about $1,000 more. But this year, the amount has actually been reduced because it is now based on the monthly allowance of members of parliament in the month preceding the election. So uh, currently, uh, uh, if, if you're an elected MP, you get an allowance of $13,750 per month, but you round this down to the next, uh, the lower uh, $500. So that ends up with $13,500. Uh, that's the election deposit. And if you do not secure at least 12% uh, of the vote, you would lose your deposit. Uh, how much can you spend? Again, there is a limit uh, on spending. $4 per voter in the single member constituencies and $4 per voter in the GRCs, but that amount is to be divided by the total number of candidates in the GRC itself. So, uh, you, you know, you actually, actually uh, spend a little bit less per candidate in terms of uh, GRC. Uh, you also have to produce something called a political donation certificate. This is a result of our Political Donations Act. Uh, you must show a record of political donations. Uh, and uh, if there is uh, more than $5,000 of any single donation, uh, that cannot be an anonymous donation. The person who donated must be named. Uh, people who are what I call habitual donors, in other words, if you donated, you know, even in small amounts or, or uh, uh, over a year, but more than $10,000 in that year, you too must also be named, right? So in other words, you can't get around this anonymity thing by sort of giving $4,999 and then you give another $4,999. That doesn't work. The whole purpose of this, of course, is to ensure that there, there is no sort of foreign interference in the voting process and that political parties are not somehow controlled by foreign agents. All candidates must file accounts, of course, at the end of elections to ensure that all of this has been complied with. Electioneering itself, right? This is what's going to happen, uh, uh, has started to happen from yesterday all the way up to cooling off day. Uh, I've divided up into two sections, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Uh, new rules come in, door-to-door -door visits are still allowed, but no longer do you have an MP with a whole or a, a candidate with a whole posse of people coming in, maximum five in a party, right? Uh, and uh, in terms of their walkabouts, same uh, limitation, you have five in the party. And if they are sort of competing groups, right, they might, uh, or, or even groups from the same party, they have to be at least one meter apart. That's, that's not very far. So, you know, they could stay... Uh, fairly close to each other, actually. 
uh, e-rallies, uh, this is the new thing that will be allowed because there's no longer any form of a live or physical rally. Live streams are the forms of campaigning. Now, in all of this, and there was some concern at the beginning whether or not uh, the e-rally speeches would have to be subject to uh, uh, the script being submitted to the Board of Census that's been clarified by Elections Department. No, you don't have to. There's no prior restraint. You can have your e-rallies. You can have live streams, other forms of campaigning with no prior restraint. You can, of course, use internet advertisements provided you declare them to be such, right? You must uh, carry some tagline like uh, advertisement paid for by this political party or sponsored by and so on. Uh, you will have, and this is again uh, uh, an uh, adaptation and amendment of the old uh, rules, uh, you have party political broadcasts, we've always had that. They've expanded the number of TV and radio sta stations that allow for this, so there's 19 channels this time around. But this one will require your script to be submitted to the uh, IMDA uh, beforehand. Uh, the allocation is three minutes per candidate. And of course, if you have a GRC uh, of four members, that's multiplied by four. And of course, you can decide whether only one will speak or one will speak in each language. Uh, these party political broadcasts must be presented in one of the four official languages. Uh, so one interesting thing in the broadcast yesterday during the nomination was that I, I saw at least two candidates speaking in Cantonese. Well, that will not be allowed uh, under the party political broadcast, right? Um, what is prohibited now? Of course, physical rallies will be prohibited. Gathering of supporters, this refers to when, you know, sort of the results are coming out and people gather at certain stadiums and so on and so forth, awaiting the results. That too uh, has also been uh, uh, banned. Uh, live broadcasts from perambulating vehicles, that's uh, not allowed. Uh, the logic given is that uh, when you have a perambulating, in other words, if you hire a truck, put loudspeakers on it, and if you're trying to make a speech going down the road, uh, the tendency is that this tends to gather crowds. Crowds tend to gather, want to hear you. So that's not allowed. You can broadcast from a perambulating vehicle, but that must be a pre-recorded broadcast, right? No songs, no films, no videos, no, nothing, uh, just pre-recorded broadcast. Uh, no thank you processions either. Once uh, elections are over, you can't uh, go again with one of these perambulating vehicles and go out and thank your constituents uh, for, for their vote. There can be no screening uh, or streaming of party political films. So again, what, is these, what are these party political films? Um, well, uh, what is allowed as party political films? Well, photos, historical, <coughs> biographical information, advertising a candidate, uh, footage of election activities, that's fine. Election advertising, uh, who has been appointed election agents, manifestos, newsletters, announcements of events, moderated chats and fora, and hyperlinks. What is prohibited is you cannot have election surveys, deep uh, polls, and so on. Uh, facilities that allow people to search for election advertising. Uh, you cannot appeal for funding and you cannot have these uh, political films which do not include, right? In other words, uh, these will be allowed. Factual documentaries, biographies or autobiographies, anniversary or commemorative videos of political parties, and finally, live recordings or events like rallies. Um, on the day of voting itself, right? Who can't vote? Those under quarantine at the moment, the rules are they are not allowed to vote. However, if you have a stay at home notice, you will be allowed to vote, but only within the magic hour of 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And for those who are under these stay home uh, notices and so on in uh, hotels, uh, at the moment, we know that there are four such special polling stations that have been established at Marina Bay Sands and Marriott South Beach Hotels. Uh, and what happens here is that they are supposed to stay in their rooms uh, and a mobile polling team will bring a ballot box to them. Now, we have not actually seen how that's going to look like. So this is completely new. Uh, it's going to be quite interesting. Um, then who is allowed to be in the polling station? Uh, the returning officer, of course, has to be there. Police officers, election staff, voters at the designated time of voting. And uh, th this year, of course, they, they, in order not to overcrowd the voting stations, uh, they gave uh, each voter a two-hour window uh, when to vote, right? Uh, 
the elderly are given a sort of uh, the earliest slot from 8 a.m. to 10 uh, a.m. And uh, of course, if they miss it, they can go into priority queues. The rest of us will just sort of try to stay within that two hour window. Um, candidates can be there and authorize polling agents. Uh, now, candidates may authorize polling agents. Uh, the ratio is one, uh, uh, one polling agent per candidate for every 1,000 voters uh, may be there at the polling station. Um, what happens after the poll? Ballot boxes will be moved by bus uh, to designated counting centers. They are not counted in the places where you voted. They, they are centralized, a number of them. Uh, and usually in these buses, they are accompanied by both the election officers as well as polling agents. Sometimes the candidate hops on the bus as well. Each candidate may appoint at the for the counting purposes one counting agent uh, for uh, each candidate. And uh, one new uh, rule uh, in, in this election is that there will be an automatic recount if the difference is 2% or less. Now, previously, the rule was that if it's 2% or less, then uh, any one of the parties uh, or candidates can request a recount. There's no longer a need for any kind of request. Now it is automatic, right? And so uh, with these sort of guidelines, uh, let us all vote and keep in line. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you, Kevin. Let me get the video. Uh, thank you, Kevin, they're covering the ground for the candidates as well as their parties. Uh, let's quickly move on to Professor Ang, who's going to talk about how he thinks uh, media will be used and uh, what kind of impact it will make for this particular elections. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Brian, and uh, welcome in everyone. Uh, so I um, I want to leave a couple of um, messages, uh, sort of takeaway messages for you all, and so I want to tell a few stories. Right. So the first story was literally the last century. My first job I was working in newspaper, now defunct, called the Singapore Monitor. So the Monitor was uh, was actually supposed to be a broadsheet, and then unfortunately some internal things, so it became a, a, an afternoon paper, an afternoon tabloid, and we wanted to go uh, morning broadsheet, compete here on the Straits Times. Um, then the election was announced. So now think about it from the point of view of uh, someone like the editor, right? You want to go morning, the approval depends on the government, the elections around the corner. How will you pitch your reporting, right? How will you position reporting? So we had, I remember a meeting and then uh, I was, uh, you know, my first job uh, and, and as journalists were told, we are going to support the PAP, right? Uh, so we were like, okay, but yeah, you got to be fair. And said, yeah, okay, we'll be fair, all right. But I remember one Sunday and this uh, senior person uh, came in for, for an article, a pro uh, PAP article. And I was like, I remember, okay, I remember I'm the junior guy, right? Uh, I was on duty to basically go over the article to see any issues, major issues, then, you know, do some money editing. I looked at it and I told the editor in charge by right, the Sunday that these are so badly written. I'm not going to edit it. It deserves to be thrown out, you know? But the editor, the American said, no, we have to run the piece. So I don't know what he did, but he massaged it and, 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 and got it in. So we were, uh, as a paper, we were very pro uh, PAP, ran any minor story that showed opposition in a bad light. Um, I guess out of that, the sort of the proudest moment was the Sunday when the, the news came out that uh, Cham and uh, Jay had won. And the headline that we had was um, Cham and Jay win. Right, that's the news. And, uh, the straight sign train something like 791, PAP 179 of 80, 82 or 81, something like that, you know. And in fact, I'm just trying to check the biologies, uh, a book, the reductant editor, he talked about how um, uh, the monitor had, a, had the right uh, headline and the straight times uh, didn't. And of course, it's true. I mean, if you had that, I mean, if you, in the, in the news, in the you know, in the classroom, if you did that, you know, uh, PAP wins 79 out of 81 or whatever, you know, you get a B. Yeah. Uh, Chairman J.O. Win gets an A, maybe A plus, right? Um, but, okay, so that was the, the, high, the high, high point, right? But right after the election, the circulation dropped off the cliff. Uh, I remember when, you know, the paper eventually cl closed and I was having dinner uh, and then uh, 
this uh, person was interviewing me and because she was taking notes and the uh, Peter came around and said, what are you doing? You know, you, you think oh, you, you're taking notes and said, oh, I mean, I'm a journalist. Then the guy told, told, told the waiter, I'm from Singapore Monitor, I'm pointing to me. And then, and then uh, the journal, this waiter said, oh, no wonder. Right? You walked in and like, oh, no wonder. Right? Well, okay, that's why you guys folded, no? Uh, kind of embarrassing, right? Um, but I think it showed how uh, the public basically rejected the monitor. So, I mean, I mean there was no question that you wouldn't go a broadsheet, just, uh, you know, people uh, didn't uh, buy the paper. I think that uh, it leaves a very, left a very clear mark, uh, I think, with uh, Lee Kuan Yew, because he talked about how the Straits Times is a porcelain uh, bars, right? And you see that in the uh, readings. And he, I think he said that uh, when uh, he talked to Lynn Holloway and others, right? Um, and it shows how uh, the media, if it is uh, too, too biased, I think there's some bias and it is it's always, a, that one you can debate a little bit, but if it's too biased and the audience sees they're too biased, then you get rejected. Uh, there was a study done by my uh, former boss, Eddie Kuo, 1992, uh, and it showed that uh, the media, did the, the academic kind of study showed that the media was uh, biased. The opinion, to be fair, they tried to be a little more, uh, you know, uh, balanced, uh, but or your, your other reasons, right? Uh, it wasn't quite uh, with it. But I think that the one um, uh, uh, photo that uh, made a big impact, you know, I want to uh, show this, right? Uh, was this. Okay, if you guys can recall, let me move aside. All right? This is a famous Aokang field photo. And if you Google it, Aokang field photo, you get this, right? Okay, you get a sports stadium, it's the wrong one, but get this one, right? Um, this was done by Alex Ao as a blogger, Yawning Brand. Um, and it's, the funny thing is that, you know, he didn't mean to take the photo. Uh, he was just trying to get to the front, um, but he couldn't get so to the front, so crowded. So he ended up taking, uh, you know, walking up uh, 20, the 25th floor of a 25 floor uh, point block just to get a photo. And he estimated there must be about 120,000 people. Okay. But what happened is that uh, the photos at the time of uh, the paper, newspaper that covered it, Show only the stage, so you never got a sense of the the, the size of the crowd. But this photo by um, by Alex, uh, you know, made a huge difference. So after that, the media then began to show crowds that it showed that basically the opposition had a much bigger crowd, but the uh, the PAP had a far uh, thinner crowd. Um, I would say that this uh, marked uh, a change, right, uh, in in how the, the press can cover this. It was sort of forced to. Uh, and then, of course, not more recently, you see how uh, the, the, the press would be really down the middle, right? You see um, opposition on one half and then a PAP on the other half and so forth. So the, uh, the, the, the media, at least the paper, do try to be uh, more balanced that way. I think it's difficult, a bit more difficult for, for, for um, TV and, uh, and radio. I mean, basically talking about airtime, and that's what they're trying to do now, giving some uh, airtime here. Um, it's interesting that uh, uh, that uh, Kevin talked about the calling off day, right? Just in that struck uh, a, a note, right? Uh, a few, I think, a few of us here may have been in a committee. I was in a committee that looked into this issue about 2008, and uh, Chong Yu Sing, then the chairman, um, recommended uh, that the committee called Ames uh, recommended this uh, calling off uh, day. And if you think about it, the calling off day, right? Uh, uh, what happened with Hillary Clinton and uh, James Comey, right? The, uh, some investigation was going on, right? So um, that that news that some people feel but may, might have affected how the, the, the turnout. And so the cooling out day um, idea, which by the way is implemented in a few countries, so if, so Singapore's not unique in this, um, does make some uh, seem to make some se some sense. And so in the light, I want to uh, point out that Pogma, for example, uh, at one level does make some sense because you see what is happening. Of course, you can argue how the you know the government uh, uh, used may have used it in, 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 in ways. But a lot of our media laws, by the way, are, are changed 12 to 18 months before the general elections. So you look at the history, you can see this in your books, right? Um, uh, the history of the changes, 12 to 18 months before the general election. You look at POPMA, it was passed in June 2019, a year ago. Um, uh, how do we uh, see this uh, developing now? Okay, so now the big change, of course, is uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic. It's driven everybody uh, online. So uh, 2011, we did a study uh, looking at the impact of uh, the internet on the elections. We found really no impact on it. I mean, people looked at the internet for information, but when it came to voting, there was no uh, impact there. 
2015, a similar result. There was no impact of um, the, uh, the internet on the election, at least in terms of the voting outcome. People went online to get information, to get alternative views, but it, it, it didn't determine the, the way they voted. So now people ask that, how, will we, uh, how, how are things uh, different now, right? So we are all uh, uh, online, there's no um, uh, alternative. I think that a couple of things that will be interesting will be the fact that there seems to be, there will be a less uh, emotional connection, right? Uh, less of that. But I was really blown away by the Workers' Party uh, video, right? It really, uh, it, it, you know, pulls some emotional cords, right? So it's, uh, it's kind of surprising because um, the theory here says that uh, for, for the kind of emotional connection to, to, to work, it takes a bit of time. It's not immediate. Uh, it is possible to have close emotional relationships built up online, but it takes a long time. So that video was really surprised. It's, uh, it's well done. It's very, um, uh, it, you can't say really say it's slick because it is, uh, feels kind of homely, even at some level it's homely that when the guy says that, oh, you know, I was probably being a photographer because I was the youngest guy there. Right? And we can identify that we bully, we bully the young kids, right? So we can identify with that. Um, so I think that's uh, uh, the emotional connection. Looks like it may be possible after all. So we just think how uh, creative we can be in having the emotional connection. Um, the public discourse, though, is harder to see now because a lot of it is gone into um, your WhatsApp. Um, a lot of the discussions in your know, intense uh, discussions are not visible. Uh, it's, for me, as a researcher, I'm interested to know, but you know, it, it's it's a it's a challenge there. Uh, how do we uncover the kind of discussions when these are driven uh, online? Um, so I think that the media's uh, coverage would be, in a sense, superficial. You will not get a, a sense of how people really think. Um, uh, yeah, you can talk about issues, but what are they really discussing? Um, so I think that that's one. And are the, are, are the discussions kind of um, uh, comprehensive, holistic? Are they good or are they driven into your echo chambers? You know? Uh, we, 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 we need to see, we, we don't really know right now. Uh, so I think that uh, the coverage by the media therefore is what well, this time around is much more limited. I think you're, all of us here will be looking more information uh, called um, from our WhatsApp groups uh, and whatever social media groups and uh, testing that against um, what you see in media. The question now is, will this impact the elections? Okay, so here's a theory. Um, and this was uncovered, this theory was stumbled upon serendipitously. And generally, when you such serendipitous uh, findings, they are much more robust. The findings are what we call a two-step flow of information, meaning that we don't decide uh, on this, uh, on, on who to vote or what to vote based on a direct media to you kind of, of uh, situation. It's media to somebody else, like you might call an opinion leader, and then you. And when you find this kind of link, uh, this, they, they find that it works uh, better in terms of getting people to vote. So now the question is whether uh, WhatsApp will have this role or not. Will it have this two-step flow, play a critical part in this two-step flow? The theory says that you will. So this really could be your internet election in a sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ping Hua. Um, Ping Hua mentioned a little bit about uh, how we're going to consume the internet. Uh, just hang on, we want to actually collect some numbers later in our poll, which we will carry out slightly later on. Uh, but for now, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Remy to come on, uh, and he will be covering, uh, for the rest of us, you know, people who are not contesting the elections, not political parties, uh, how do the election media laws apply to us and how do we make sure that we comply with them? So Remy, over to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I'm mindful that we don't uh, have a lot of time left and we want to make time for Q&A. So uh, I'm going to deal with really uh, the one act uh, to rule them all uh, that uh, covers both media and uh, individuals. Uh, and it's also, uh, I guess, the uh, first election uh, that will be uh, trial running uh, POFMA. Uh, the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act. So I'm going to do a very short rundown. Uh, all you need to know about POFMA in five minutes. Okay. Uh, the first thing you need to know about POFMA is it only deals with statements of fact that are false. Uh, and uh, while that sounds simple, uh, it may be a bit more uh, complicated than it sounds. So uh, first, what is a statement of fact? 
Uh, the Act defines a statement of fact as a statement which a reasonable person seeing, hearing, or otherwise perceiving it would consider to be a representation of fact. Uh, so unfortunately, the definition of a statement of fact in the Act is a bit circular. Uh, it's a statement of fact if a reasonable person perceives it to be a representation of fact. Uh, second, uh, what is a false statement of fact? Uh, again, uh, the answer to that question uh, sounds a lot simpler than it actually is. Uh, the answer is that it's false if it is false or misleading. Uh, this is important, whether wholly or in part, and whether on its own or in the context in which it appears. Uh, so this is very important uh, because potentially even if you transmit a, a statement of fact that is false in the context of a much longer and larger exposition, uh, that one particular portion of the much longer exposition uh, could subject you to a correction direction or liability under POFMA. Right, uh, So there are uh, two gates to liability under POFMA that you need to know of. Uh, the first is uh, the uh, statement needs to be a false statement of fact. Uh, the second is under the Act, it needs to fall under one of six categories. Uh, so there are six subcategories that the statement of fact needs to uh, relate to. Uh, first, the statement of fact needs to be prejudicial to the security of Singapore or any part of Singapore. Uh, it uh, may be subject to POFMA if it's false, as well as being prejudicial to public health, public safety, public tranquility, or public finances. So, for instance, if you transmit false statements of fact about incorrect POFMA numbers, uh, that may, uh, sorry, uh, incorrect COVID numbers, that may subject you to uh, POFMA correction direction. If you transmit false statements of fact about the state of public finances, uh, that may also subject you to uh, POFMA correction direction. Uh, false statements of fact that are prejudicial to the fr friendly relations of Singapore with other countries are also caught under POFMA. So recently, there was a correction direction issued uh, to the State News uh, Times, Singapore. Uh, that was an article about bilateral relations between uh, Malaysia and Singapore and uh, purported requests by Singapore to Malaysia to uh, open up the borders after COVID. So uh, a statement like that, that is false, uh, would be subject to POFMA. Uh, the fourth category, and that's the most relevant for the times we live in now, is uh, a false statement that is meant to influence the outcome of an election to the Office of President, a general election of members of parliament or a uh, referendum. So in the present context, false statements of fact uh, about uh, individuals potentially or a political party uh, would subject you to uh, liability under POFMA. Uh, false statements of fact, uh, category five, uh, that are meant to incite feelings of enmity, hatred or ill will between different groups of persons. Uh, will also subject you to a POFMA correction direction or criminal uh, liability. Uh, and the last is a false statement of fact that diminishes public confidence in the performance of any duty or function in the exercise of any power by the government or an organ of state or a statutory board or part of government and organ of state or a statutory board will subject you to liability under POFMA. Uh, what types of liability are there under POFMA? Uh, first, criminal liability can attach, but so far nobody has actually been charged or fined under POFMA. Second, and most commonly seen uh, to date, are correction directions by the uh, ministry that takes the view your statement is incorrect and needs to be corrected. Uh, and uh, the most important question that uh, you need to answer as a member of the public or as media, if you see a correction direction from a ministry, uh, is first comply first, appeal later, or ask questions later. Because the failure to comply with a correction direction will subject you to criminal liability. So you don't want that. You can always appeal the direction later to the minister and subsequently to the High Court. But if you see a correction direction, 
uh, there is no skin of your nose to publish the correction direction and the link to which the correct information can be uh, found, uh, you can always uh, appeal that uh, direction uh, later. Uh, so that, as promised, is uh, POFMA in five minutes. And I hope, Brian, that still uh, leaves us with a good amount of time for Q&A. Thanks. Uh, I, I think it does. Uh, so very interesting um, uh, information that we've, we've gotten from all three speakers. Um, I just wanted to dive quickly into some of the questions uh, that have been posed. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame the question first and then maybe I'll suggest uh, some people to dive in, right? So Rebbe, it's good you talked about um, Hofba. I think the question now here is also how about uh, the, the, the anti-doxing laws uh, and maybe even the PDPA, right? Uh, and what happens in a scenario, that hypothetical scenario, um, someone is trying to be a, a, a whistleblower, right? And so he shares certain information about a candidate uh, which shows that candidate to maybe have some character flaws, a bit nasty guy. Uh, will any of those laws uh, apply and, uh, uh, to that situation? Uh, so the, um, uh, first, the, the first uh, is uh, POFMA could potentially apply. Uh, depending on whether or not there are any statements inside your polls uh, that are false or misleading. Uh, doxing could potentially apply under the new amendments to the uh, Protection from Harassment Act if it involves the publication of uh, identity for the purposes of harassing, threatening, or facilitating uh, violence against uh, an individual. Uh, but uh, in context, um, unless it is very clear that you are trying to uh, get the mob to react in a particular way against a candidate uh, to harass, threaten, or facilitate uh, violence against uh, that individual, uh, doxing uh, potentially less likely. So the context in which we've seen uh, doxing uh, investigations so far are, for instance, viral videos about situations that really get people angry and where threats are made against an individual's uh, family. So uh, recently, there was the uh, controversy about uh, dog adoption gone wrong. Uh, where uh, adopting family uh, took in a dog and then subsequently put the dog down without giving the uh, um, uh, uh, adoption house the opportunity to take the dog back. Uh, I think in the course of that, the identity of the adopting family was uh, released and certain threats were made against the family, uh, uh, suggesting that they were going to go after the family's children. Uh, and photos uh, and details uh, about uh, uh, that were, were leaked. Uh, so that's the kind of context in which doxing investigations uh, have happened uh, in the context of elections, more likely uh, POFMA. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, Prof. Brian, yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody had asked whether, you know, in case of uh, one of the PAP can, uh, potential candidates, right, whether that is a character assassination or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we have to draw the line and be clear that it is not. If you have uh, you know, specific allegations, uh, it is not. It is character assassination. You make some, you know, uh, ad hominem attack, um, you know, it's unsubstantiated or it's false or it's, um, you know, vague. But if it's clear and it's almost like whistleblowing, then it's not character assassination. You know, I, think, I think there's some uncertainty of that. And so they say you shouldn't do this, you know, in future because it's character assassination. Okay, that's a good point. I, I also remember uh, one of the political parties had that same issue. Uh, they're not sure whether the, uh, the scripts needed to be cleared for all of their e-rallies and uh, uh, Professor Kevin had already um, clarified that. So uh, thanks for that, Prof. Um, Professor Kevin Tan, okay, question for you. Um, in Australia, some candidates have been accused of receiving money from foreign businessmen or foreign governments. Um, is that what our laws that you talked about, um, trying to prevent that kind of interference uh, would, would apply? Well, actually, first of all, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no ban on you receiving monies from foreign uh, donors. You just mm -hmm. have to make known who these people are. 
right? And uh, this is declared in the certificate and this is submitted uh, to, to, to the uh, elections department. Um, so I think this is the, 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 the essence of it. It's not that you uh, are not allowed to get money from a foreigner. I mean, there could well be a very wealthy Singaporean who lives abroad and he decides that he's going to donate to your cause and that's fine. Um, what they don't want is people uh, from overseas. And then this could come from, I don't know, slush funds, could come from the CIA, could come from God knows who without you knowing exactly where these funds are coming from, right? So once I know who is actually funding a political party, uh, I can actually call you out if I can say, well, look, uh, you know, this, com this, this, this political party uh, is basically being uh, used by certain agents. And these are the people that um, uh, have been donating money to that particular political party. So I think that's the main purpose, right? You do not want uh, unknown puppet masters working behind the scenes and then uh, calling the shots for these particular political parties who then uh, do nothing more than act as proxies. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I also do know that there are uh, rules against uh, underage um, people. So I think the, the, the age um, is 18. Uh, kids under 18 shouldn't take part in uh, election activities, I guess. Uh, the question is this. Uh, so were kids uh, participating in, let's say, uh, discussion forums, um, posting on Facebook pages uh, on political matters, would, would that fall foul of uh, those laws also? Wow. Uh, I think that one's a little bit difficult because, I mean, taking part in political activities exactly what does that mean, right? Mm. Uh, I don't think, uh, because if you say that if you're below the age of 18 uh, and you're not allowed to, to discuss or to deal with anything political whatsoever, then you're effectively telling people that they are not supposed to know there's an election around. Right. They can't say right. anything. Uh, well, they, they, I, can't, I, they, they can't join a political party or they can't yes. you know, so I, I go think, wave I think, flags. I yeah. think the, the proper way for that to be interpreted is that they mm. are actually being... You see, what again, be, the spirit behind it, you know, and I, I hope I'm correct on this, is that you don't want uh, people making use of young people in a way that... Uh, you, you know, it's not upfront, right? You, you right. Uh, so so if you engage in a forum, I mean, there's nothing to stop a, a fifteen or sixteen year old from going into one of the political websites and commenting on uh, on a speech that was made on nomination day. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, is that engaging in politics? I don't think that that's the spirit of it. The spirit is you don't want to be using young people who are impressionable or easily impressionable, at least the presumption being that uh, they go out there and then, you know, start spreading the, your dogma, your, your particular uh, party platform, right? Okay. Uh, I think we're down to the last two questions. So maybe a question for Professor Ang first. Um, so Professor Ang, you, you talked a little bit about your time at the Singapore Monitor, and that's quite interesting. Uh, looks like you are clearing material. Uh, is there a clearinghouse uh, in Singapore that uh, helps uh, someone clear his... Uh, is his content? Uh, uh, no, there isn't such a clearing house. Uh, and in fact, there was an attempt, uh, I don't recall now, um, by uh, Sintercom to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is under the, uh, the time was, I think, SBA, Singapore Broadcasting Authority, and they declined. And so, in fact, that's why Sintercom uh, closed, because you couldn't tell the political uh, content or not. Right. Uh, so there isn't a, 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 such a clearing house. And it's good that doing such a clearing house to be considered prior restraint, which is the worst form of censorship. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, I'm, I'm, I don't have this, I'm glad we don't have this. It does require taking some risk in a sense. Um, so in a way you have to be careful, uh, but I think having a clearing house is actually even worse. Right, so you got to watch what kind of content, where you get your content from, uh, get, get the permissions if you're using somebody else's picture, music, that kind of stuff also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, then maybe last question. Um, to Professor Kevin Tan, back to you. Um, I don't know if you, you can talk about this, the Political Donation Act. Uh -huh, okay. Right. Uh, does it apply to that situation about uh, donations from non-Singapore citizens? Or does it apply here for the elections or, 
is it something else well i think the uh, it it simply it you see it's quite clever in the sense that it doesn't say singaporeans non singaporeans and so on you cannot be anonymous mm-hmm. right and so the moment you uh Uh, donate beyond five thousand dollars, or you donate an aggregate of up to ten thousand dollars within a given calendar year. Dan, your name has got to be reviewed, right? Right. So, okay. so at least, so of course, if the authorities decide that uh, particular donors seem to be uh, look dangerous or something, then that's up to the authorities to do the investigation. So they don't make this distinction really. Between foreigners and non-foreigners. Of course, if you want to be a member of a political party in Singapore, you have to be a polit- Singaporean, right? But right. Uh, in terms of donation, uh, they don't make that kind of distinction. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, I, I'm going to bring the Q and A to a close because there are two more things that we want to do. I'm going to bring up the the, the closing poll. So can we have that up now? Okay, so there are two questions uh, in the poll. So if you can see the poll, okay, it's disappeared on my screen. Can everyone see the poll? Great. Okay, so the closing poll. There are two questions. You fill up the first one, scroll down, and there's the second question. Um, please help us answer both, uh, and we can get through. Okay, for the first question, where do you get most of your political news? Uh, just select the button, right? Okay, and then scroll down to answer the second question. Uh, what is the best way for a candidate to reach you during the elections? And that's very personal to each one. So I mean, okay, and click submit when you're done. Okay. I'll let everyone have another twenty seconds to answer both questions. And Anka, if you could get ready for your part. Okay, let's see the poll results. Are the results out? Okay, so the first question: uh, Where do you get most of your political news? Slightly more than half uh, social media, followed by uh, internet, non-social media. So I guess uh, you know, blogs and stuff like that. Uh, followed by print media, uh, and then TV and private chat groups, uh, kind of in a tie. Okay, what's the best way for a candidate to reach you? Wow, selling one percent say social media. Okay, we may be preaching to the converted here because uh, this is an internet society meeting. Uh, but then uh, followed by not social media, internet, face to face. Okay, yeah, granted, and then print media. Okay, that's the closing poll. Um, Anka is going to come up and uh, sum up uh, today's uh, content, uh, and I've entitled it. Uh, I think something along the lines of uh, "What to do when you get into trouble." So, Anka, all yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, Brian. Um, and uh, just very quickly, I don't want to stand between everyone here and what's happening at 8 p.m. So, um, well. I, I personally learned a lot about um, the election process. So um, I think uh, Prof. Kevin Tan walked us through very, very um, efficiently um, uh, as to what a candidate uh, or a political party should should and should not be doing. So there's a long list of you know things they need to be complying with, right? So that's the compliance aspect of it. Um, then. Um, I'll, I'll skip to Remy for for the moment. Then Remy talked about um, give us a very nice lowdown on on the POFMA, and and I think that's more of the 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 criminal liability aspect of it. Uh, what we should not be doing, and and what happens if we do those things? What are the kinds of um, repercussions? Right. So we haven't had anyone being fined or charged under the POFMA so far, but many correction correction directions have been issued. Um, and then uh, Prof. Ang, very interesting, um, talked about whether this is going to be the internet election. Uh, perhaps the the previous election was also an internet election in some ways, but now with COVID, um, you know, um, things are much more heightened. And as as we just saw from the poll, 
a lot of us access our election information on social media. So um, perhaps this trend is going to, you know, accelerate. And uh, what does that mean for, for the ordinary citizen? And I guess my own takeaway from this is, um, as an ordinary citizen, as someone who, who's a, you know, a keen follower of, of these trends, is to basically be aware of the law. Um, even if you can't influence the law itself, it's good to be aware. And actually, there are ways in which you can influence the lawmaking process. You can participate in public consultations. Uh, you can participate in discussions like this, which we have at the Internet Society. You know, um, you can make yourself a little bit more aware about uh, how the laws are changing. So I think uh, for any citizenry, it's 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 their it's their responsibility to you know do their bit and and keep up to date with the law because as they say, ignorance of law is no excuse. Uh, the laws are becoming more complicated as we speak. Um, you know, technology when they apply to technology, it's a whole new ball game altogether. But there are obviously ways we can, you know, stay in touch and try and demystify some of those things. So I think staying out of trouble to a large extent, the message I get here is also keeping in touch with the laws and policies. And um, yeah, and please continue to, you know, participate in, in, in fora like this. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I can probably sum it up with that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Anka. Um, so with this, I'm going to call this to a close. Um, you know, please join me in thanking the speakers. Um, and uh, speakers, just hang on. I need to get your details for, for something else. Um, but uh, I also do want to mention that a recording of this, uh, this, this session, uh, we want to make this available to other people. So it's going to be available on Facebook as well as YouTube uh, pretty shortly. Uh, and so, you know, your friends who have missed this uh, can catch up with that. Um, and that's all, you know, I wish you a good evening. I think some of you want to go on and join the debates or, or watch the debates. Um, and uh, thank you for attending tonight's uh, webinar and we'll see you soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for attending. Bye. Very good. Yeah, great.